Thus, the object is in part immediate being or in general, a thing corresponding to immediate consciousness in part an othering of itself, its relationship or being for an other and being for itself. That is determinateness corresponding to perception and in part essence or in the form of a universal corresponding to the understanding. It is as a totality, a syllogism or the movement of the universal through determination to individuality as also the reverse movement from individuality through superseded individuality or through determination to the universal. It is therefore in accordance with these three determinations that consciousness must know the object as itself. However, this knowing of which we are speaking is not knowing as pure comprehension of the object that is in terms of the notion here, this knowing is to be indicated only in its process of coming to be or in the moments of that aspect of it, which belongs to consciousness as such the moments of the notion proper or of pure knowing in the form of shapes of consciousness. For this reason, the object does not yet appear in consciousness as such as the spiritual essentiality we have just affirmed it to be. And the relationship of consciousness to it is not the consideration of it in this totality as such, nor in its pure form as notion, but it is from one side, a shape of consciousness as such. And from the other side, a number of such shapes, which we bring together in which the totality of the moments of the object and of the relation of consciousness to it can be indicated only as resolved into its moments. Paragraph 789 is picking up right from where the first paragraph of this new section, absolute knowing was leading us into. It's got a reference here, thus the object, the Gegenstein, right? And we're going to look at the different dimensions of that in just a moment. And it's shorter than this lead in paragraph, but I would say there's actually just as much going on. So we, we need to linger over this, or if you want to make a Hegelian joke, we need to tarry with the negative, going back to the preface, you know, uh, a little bit. And what is this paragraph ultimately about? Well, it's about absolute knowing and Hegel is contrasting in the heart of this paragraph, uh, two different, what should we call them? Modalities or ways or you know, uh, consciousnesses of knowing, of vision, right? And we should pause for a second and think about absolute knowing, right? So this is the final section of the phenomenology. It's quite short. It's supposed to be the culmination of this entire process that we've gone through with all of these, as we're going to see referenced here, shapes, gestalten of consciousness that as phenomenologists, we had to examine and observe and that Hegel takes <coughs> historical humanity and the development of our consciousness to have been working itself out in, right? So we're going we're to come back to that in a moment, but what is this contrast? This is about halfway through this particular paragraph where he says, this knowing of which we are speaking, the, the knowing of which the reda, the, the discourse is, is not knowing as pure comprehension of the object that is in terms of the notion and that's uh, Miller's gloss on it. So it's not completely conceptual yet. You know, we made this transition very explicitly at the end of the religion section. Religion is about Vorstellung or representation or picture thinking, however you like it, imagination. And we need to make it conceptual thinking, right? We're not quite there, even though we are in this section, right? So it's not purely conceptual or notional. It's not pure comprehension of the object. Instead, he says here, this knowing is to be indicated or pointed at quite literally 
only in its process of coming to be. Now, process of coming to be is a little bit of a pleonasm. Hegel doesn't use a word like process in there. As a matter of fact, it's just sein ist werden. Werden is a very important verb in German, right? It means to become, to uh, come on the scene, to develop, right? To change in, in a kind of process, right? So you could say process is already built into that. And so that is what our knowledge here is going to be of, right? The knowing is to be indicated only in its process to be or in the moments of that aspect of it, which belongs to consciousness as such. And we'll, we'll come back to that in a moment because he says a few other things about that as well. And I do want to remind us that absolute knowing as a word is kind of productively ambiguous. The absolute is part of what we are trying to develop this in of, right? But that absolute includes us. It includes our, you know, interlocking, uh, developing culture, we could say, not just of individual places like say Germany or France, but of rationality and spirit more generally, which of course Hegel, you know, associates with Europe. He's clearly Eurocentric, but we don't necessarily have to follow him in that. So, you know, our absolute knowing is knowing of the absolute, but it's also absolute knowing in the sense on the subject, the knowing subject side, knowing in an absolute way. And that's what we're trying to get to. And that is going to involve you could say a recuperation and reconfiguration of the previous shapes of consciousness that we have gone through so far. And in this particular paragraph, it's the shapes of consciousness as we find them in the consciousness section, the very early part of the work, right? So Hegel is coming back and doing something you've seen him do in the phenomenology several times, referencing back and saying, oh, by the way, we didn't leave behind entirely these previous dynamics and developments and dialectics of consciousness. Keep them in your back pocket as superseded, as sublated, aufgehobenes, because you're going to need them later on. Here is where we actually do need them. So, uh, coming back to the beginning of this, he talks about the object, the Gegenstand, and he says it is partly or in part, right? And he uses this word three times, tiles. So this is saying you got this over here, you got this over here, and you got this over here. Just like we've diagrammed, right? We have immediate being. And what is immediate being? And it's just a straightforward translation of unmittelbar seins. So, you know, this is one part of the object, what we're trying to understand, what we're trying to wrap our head around. Uh, another part is going to be the othering of itself, right? And then the third part is essence or vasen. So we have a difference here between uh, sometimes Vazen gets used or translated as being. Here it really is essence as opposed to immediate being. What it is the thing is supposed to be, right? So let's unpack each of these in turn. He says, the object is in part immediate being or in general, überhaupt, a thing, ein Ding. Oh, really, a bunch of things, anything you want, right? Because what are we talking about here? What is this? correspond to. So here Hegel uses the term saying it, it corresponds to immediate consciousness, right? Uh, Bewusstsein. But what are we really talking about here? Sense certainty. All this stuff that we went through with, you know, talking about trees and here and now, all that interesting dialectic that was happening back in the sense certainty section. So we've got a shape of consciousness here. One which was, you know, went through a lot of development. It's not just, ooh, there it is, you know, one, one paragraph and we're done with it. We went through a, a whole, you know, 
set of decades of paragraphs. Okay, so then we've got the othering of itself, right? And he tells us this is a little bit more complex. So he says, in part, an othering of itself. And there's two, you could say, aspects to this. It's relationship, right, for healthness, or being for another, or it's determinateness, bestimmtheit, which is being for self. And this makes sense. You know, relationship does involve relationship with another. If you don't have another, you don't have a relationship. I mean, it could be a self relationship in which you're treating yourself as other, right? That happens a lot in Hegel's dialectics. And determinateness, being for self. Now, isn't it interesting that he ties in determinateness, uh, you know, taking on some sort of determinate qualities, um, you know, configurations in its own self as being not for another, but being for itself. A thing knows itself or manifests itself in determinate ways. And here we must be talking about not, you know, objects like a piece of chalk or a tie or a piece of technology even, but subjects that are grasping themselves. And then he goes on and he says, well, this corresponds to perception, you know? And if you think back to the perception section, the second section in the consciousness coming right after the initial uh, sense certainty section, it is perception or the thing, perception or the thing and its qualities, right? So now we're trying to understand things in relation to other things and as determinate. Okay, good. So far, you know, understanding that. And then we get to the next one. He says, or in, you know, in part essence in the form of a universal, alt algemeines. It's not actually saying form here. That's Miller adding that in, but as the universal, as something universal. So the essence, as we traditionally conceive of it, you know, in philosophy, we often say, well, what is it that connects all the beds together and makes them beds or chairs or human beings or, you know, fuzzy little creatures we call squirrels, right? And we take the, the thing, the, the idea, whatever it is that connects all of them, the universal, to be its essence. And so this, he says, corresponds to the understanding. And what does he mean by that? Force in the understanding, actually one of the most difficult portions of the phenomenology to which Hegel devotes a lot of paragraphs. And there's more than just the development of the understanding or the concept of force going on there. It actually leads to this dialectic between different worlds, all interconnected with each other. And as we go on from immediate being to essence, we get a more and more complex picture that we're working with in which we are ourselves more and more explicitly involved. So that's a little bit of, you know, rehearsal of what went on. And then he says something really, really interesting. He says, it is as a totality, totality is a fine translation for Gantz's, uh, a syllogism or the movement of the universal through determination to individuality. We'll, we'll get to that in a moment. A movement, bewegung, no problem with that. We need to be careful about this word syllogism. Now, Hegel is indeed very interested in the syllogism and in syllogisms and in the kind of reasoning processes that go with this and what syllogisms can produce or reveal to us. But he doesn't say syllogism here. He says schluss. Right, a process, uh, and it, could it be a syllogism? Yes, a process of inference, a conclusion, quite literally. But he doesn't say syllogism. So you want to be a little bit careful. Now, there are indeed three terms. Uh, Hegel does use, you know, a really, let's say, taking liberties, sometimes wildly, treatment of syllogisms in the phenomenology. He's done that 
many, many times, right? You talked about the middle term and you know, what we can conclude, but we don't want to think that there's something like syllogistic reasoning going on here, the kind of stuff that you might have studied in a introduction to logic class, because that's not what is actually happening. It's more a complex process of inference. And it goes both ways, right? So he talks about beginning with the universal and then through determination, right? Through bestimmtheit uh, into individuality, einzelnheit. So how do we go from having things that are universal and then determining them and then getting individual things, whether it's the objects that we're studying, like that fuzzy little squirrel over there who's, you know, chewing on something in the park and maybe we can get him to come over and give him some nuts or something, to ourselves and even bigger things, the process of history as understood through dialectical consciousness, right? How do we individuate those things? And then we work our way backwards, as he says, um, there we go, the universal through determination to individuality as also the reverse movement from individuality through individuality as superseded, aufgehobene, right? Important term in the Hegelian dialectic, isn't it? Aufheben. So it supersedes itself as we've seen it happen many, many times in the course of our studies. And also, by the way, is happening in the consciousness section. When you are reading Force in the Understanding and you're realizing that you are one of the subjects that Hegel is narrating this not just to, but on the behalf of, you could say, you are originally an individual, now you're superseding that, and then you get to the universal. This is happening all the time in the phenomenology without us explicitly realizing it. That's why Hegel wants to tell us that right here and right now. So he goes on and he says that um, it is in accordance with these three determinations. Now, what are the three determinations? Are they immediate being, othering of itself, and essence? I mean, it seems like if we're going to find determination, isn't it already under othering of ourself? Well, yes, but each of these is a determination, a bestimmtheit, something, you know, particular in relation to each other. But it could also be, here's where the ambiguity comes in, individuality, determinateness, which is superseded individuality, and the universal. So it's actually not clear um, from the context. And I, I would suggest we should read both of these. So he, he says that... Uh, in accordance with these three determinations, consciousness must know the object as itself. Consciousness must realize that it is involved in the process of knowing the object. And the object includes all of these, as he says, moments. Here we come back to the, this knowing of which we're speaking is not knowing as pure comprehension of the object, that is in terms of the notion. It is indicated only in its process of coming to be, or what is this process of coming to be? The moments of that aspect of it, which belongs to consciousness as such. The moments of the notion proper or of pure knowing in the form of shapes of consciousness, gestalten, right? So this is what we've been studying the entire time. These are moments both understood here in this paragraph as sort of telescoped out into the previous uh, you know, consciousness section and as those shapes as they were worked out in the same section. So those are the moments of this knowing that we are engaged in. All right, so, so far so good. He goes on and he says, for this reason, the object does not yet appear in consciousness. The object that we're trying to begin with, the object that has all of these as its, its uh, components or uh, moments, right? For this reason, the object does not yet appear in consciousness as such as the spiritual essentiality, right? Wesenheit, 
that we have just affirmed it to be. So there's something that we still need to work out. You know, good thing there's some more paragraphs yet to come, not many of them, so we better work it out quick. And he goes on and he says, and the relationship of consciousness to it is not the consideration of it in this totality, Gansheit, as such, nor in its pure form as notion, but now notice what he's going to say here. It is from one side a shape of consciousness as such, right? So we scrutinize, we follow through dialectically as phenomenologists, a particular shape of consciousness. We work it through, you know, we've gone through all of these very interesting ones uh, throughout the course of studying the phenomenology. It's probably taken us quite a while. We've probably had to go at it a number of times, but we've got them up in our head. We're like, you know, at least I understand how the, uh, you know, phrenology and physiognomy section works. Or at least I understand this reference to the Antigone and the two laws. Or at least I understand freedom and the terror, you know, or pick whatever it is that you want. So we've got individual shapes, but there's many of them, aren't there? throughout this work. So he says, from the other side, a number of shapes, which now notice this, we bring together. Hegel's been bringing these shapes together for us in this complex work. He's also saying, hey, you reader, you know, more than 200 years after I finished this book, there's a we here. We're going along, we're recognizing these different shapes, we're arranging them in relation to each other, we're seeing the connections, we're seeing them as moments of some sort of object that we understand, that we know, right? So uh, a number of such shapes which we bring together in which the totality of the moments of the object, the totality of the moments of the object, that's all of this stuff here, and of the relation, relation of consciousness to it, well, that's us. I mean, you could say the relation of consciousness, okay, they're all part of the consciousness section, right? So that makes sense. But we're consciousness too, right? We're reading that so that we actually understand what the hell we're doing when we cognize or relate ourselves to an object or even to space and time in general or to, you know, properties of things or to a world, right? So this is quite important. It's not just the object that has its moments. We are in relation to that object. And that's part of what each of these moments is unpacking, signifying, designating for us. And so he goes on and he says, um, in which the totality of the moments of the object and the relation of consciousness to it can be indicated only as resolved into its moments. As this point, we're not yet ready to synthesize, to bring all of this together, to you know, sublate everything in some you know, finalized absolute knowing. We're getting closer, but we're not quite there. We're working our way to it, towards it, into it, right? So this is quite an important paragraph. In the paragraphs to come, we're going to see other dialectics, other shapes of consciousness, similarly being re-examined by Hegel and you might say put into their proper place. But that's what is happening in this paragraph. So you can see that it's setting the stage for more to come. And from a Hegelian perspective, it's also carrying out a deepening of our not just understanding, but knowledge of the coming to be of what happened, all these you know, objects for us, and our own relation of knowing to these objects.